so this should be a pretty short presentation uh, just because I'm, I'm just going to be showing off some paintings and just talking about uh, some of the highlights. Uh, thank you, Breton. Um, so hopefully this won't be uh, too long. So I think I will get started. So uh, mineral art. Let's let's get to work. So about the artist. Um, so my name is Tommy Higuchi. Uh, I've been collecting minerals for about five years now. Um, but I didn't really get into the mineral community until a year ago uh, when I kind of started interacting with people on uh, Mindat. And then um, uh, I guess I could call him a mentor at this point, uh, Paul Brands from Mindat. He um, linked me up to um, YMC on Facebook, so I made a Facebook account to join in. And that really kicked everything off. That's when I started meeting all these new people from the mineral community. And <laughs> unfortunately for my wallet, that's when I really began uh, getting into the, you know, the good stuff, the really nice uh, thumbnail and miniature specimens. Uh, and then recently I've been really getting into uh, Namibia and South Africa. That's kind of uh, one of my little focuses in my collection. But overall, I do focus on uh, aesthetics, uh, first and foremost, and color. And uh, this love of minerals kind of became, became uh, combined with my love of art. So I've been, you know, a painting and drawing for as long as I can remember. Uh, so eventually I kind of brought these two hobbies together and that is what uh, created this, uh, not a career, but this, this thing, this big thing that I'm doing now. Um, so let's get into it. I'm going to share this piece first because this is the very first mineral painting that I had ever done. Um, Nicole, if, if you're watching, if you made it, uh, this is in your collection now. I, I just recently gave this to Nicole from uh, the Rock Courier Lives that you guys, I'm sure, are familiar with. Um, so, very, very first painting, of course, of a aquamarine and a shoral combination, because that's one of my favorite things in the world. Um, and, of course, you'll, you'll see throughout the presentation that this is a pretty... Uh, rudimentary painting but i had a lot of fun with this i think my favorite part is the shoral here um where you can see like the the different ways the light hits this crystal um and then here at the termination you have this this very uh, transparent termination and then it kind of fades into this more opaque blue um so this is like my first shot at kind of trying to create this illusion of transparency in my artwork and uh, that alibi, I remember, gave me a very hard time. It was it was very tricky to get that texture in there, but I did my best. <laughs> um, so aquamarine, swirl, Oranga Mountains, of course, uh, and this is watercolor. Oh, one thing. Um, so I didn't include this here in the description, but I started out painting my specimens. Uh, well, I, I painted the backgrounds with sumi ink, which is this traditional um, Japanese ink. That's very, very pigmented. You don't have to dilute it or anything. It's it's super, super dark. So I, I found that works really nicely uh, for creating the backgrounds in my paintings. So next we have uh, Quartz, a uh, variety amethyst from Jackson Crossroads in Georgia. And this is such a fantastic specimen aesthetic wise and also just the color. You have some of those red tones, but you have this really beautiful purple. Um, and the matrix has these very, very fine, detailed little quartz points everywhere. And of course, the contrast between the purple and the white matrix is really lovely. So uh, as many of you may know, this is in the collection of the, <laughs> this is in the collection of the Walensky Gallery. Definitely not my piece. Um, so this, this is a typo. Uh, Troy, for watching, I did not sneak into your gallery and take your amethyst. Um, but really fantastic piece. Um, very, very fun to work on just because of all of the variations of color here in these little uh, amethyst points. And there's a lot of, I guess you could call them phantoms here in the, in the amethyst. Um, so just lots of different textures to work with in this piece. Um, this was done on a five by five inch um, 
uh, piece of paper, which is quite small. Um, it was very difficult to get details into such a small piece of paper, um, but I think it turned out pretty nicely. Um, so next up, another uh, Walensky piece. This one might be my favorite painting so far that I've done. Um, so this is Indicolite on Quartz and Albi, or Clevelandite if you like. Um, 8 by 10 inches, watercolor on paper. Um, just left it on a white background this time. So the interesting thing about this is normally I fear <laughs> painting tourmalines. Tourmalines are very, very difficult because oftentimes you have the zoning and these uh, interesting fractures inside the tourmaline. But when it's photographed, you also get these um, highlights that kind of reflect off of the outer striation. So you get these two different, um, how would you say this? Two dimensions to the piece. And that is very, very difficult to convey in painting. So when I uh, saw this photo, this reference photo, I got very excited because this whole piece is just backlit to show the kind of interesting subtle zoning and the really, really bright blue colors. Um, so this was actually a tourmaline that I really enjoyed painting for once. I mean, of course, I enjoy all of my work, but this one was uh, more therapeutic than most, I would say. Um, yeah, Breton, if you saw this piece in person, uh, you're very lucky. I saw this in one of the uh, Tucson, um, uh, What's Hot in Tucson videos that uh, the wonderful uh, Brian had uh, put on YouTube. So go check that out if, if you can. Uh, very, very fun. I, I spend a lot of time watching what's hot in Tucson uh, in the background while I paint. Just seemed appropriate. Um, one other thing that's kind of interesting about this piece is the quartz here. I kind of tried out a new technique on this piece where, um, hi, Brian, <laughs> just talking about you. Um, but I tried a new technique here um, where I flood like an entire face of the crystal with water. And then I add drops of color, which creates these uh, blurry kind of blooms of color. And I found that's really effective in um, kind of uh, emphasizing like the, the more subtle shadows that you see in some of these crystals. And here's a little close up of all of these striations. Um, very difficult to paint in a straight line, by the way. <laughs> All right, next up, this is uh, one of my favorite, favorite specimens in my collection. This, uh, of course, Aquamarine and Shoral uh, on Orthoclase, I believe, from the Yorongo Mountains, my favorite locality. Um, so this piece, I think this was the first painting I did on a white background. Um, traditionally, I, I had painted most of my pieces on black backgrounds just because that's how uh, I saw a lot of um, mineral photography being portrayed. But... I am very, very into this whole white background thing that I've been doing recently, just because I think it adds this dimension, dimensionality, because you, you get the opportunity to add these shadows here. And I think that really gives the entire painting more of a 3D effect. Um, so I just am really, really enjoying that. So whenever I get the chance, I try to paint on a white background if the specimen allows it. And, and of course, the reason why I did this was obviously a great percentage of the specimen is shoral. And that would have blended right into that black background. So that was uh, my incentive. Uh, fun thing about this is all the tiny little dots of iron oxides. Uh, I thought about leaving that out because sometimes I wonder if I should idealize specimens in these paintings. But I find adding all of these little details kind of adds to the realism and it's more true to the specimen, of course. Let's see. Okay, this was a fun one. Um, so this is a uh, rhodochrosite, uh, obviously from the very famous uh, Nichwaning Mines in South Africa. Hope that I pronounced that right. Um, so this is in the collection of my good friend, uh, Alan. You guys might know him on Instagram. He has a fantastic collection, really, really, Beautiful tourmalines, beautiful gemmy crystals, um, just really great stuff. This is actually an ex courier piece, um, and it's amazing. And getting the opportunity to paint such an incredible specimen like this is—it's always really rewarding. Um, 
again, another pretty difficult piece. There, there's a lot of different striations and all of these um, changes, subtle changes in value um, that I had to implement. So oftentimes when you have these white highlights, especially the very light striations, as you can see in the, these darker areas, it takes a lot of focus to try to paint around those striations. So that is not um, a white paint over because watercolor is a purely additive medium. So you cannot, you, you have to preserve the white of the paper when you want your highlights. So it takes a little extra focus and, and uh, effort to try to, um, how do you say this? Create, almost carve out those highlights um, out from the paint. Have, Niels, have I tried painting the reflection when using a black background? You know, that's something I considered. Um, I have not tried it yet, but I think that would look very, very interesting in a painting. So you know what? I might end up trying that for one of my next personal pieces just to try it out. Um, no, I did not stack this image, Brian. <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's an interesting idea. I might try that. So next up, another really, really, really awesome specimen that I adore is... Oh, I lost sound? Hope you guys can hear me. Um, hope you can figure that out, Chris. That's, that's odd. Just let, you guys let me know if you can hear anything. <laughs> um, there is a bit of a lag, so that might take a minute to load. But anyways, this is a stibnite on calcite specimen from uh, Shikuangshan uh, SV deposit. Thank you, Brian. Um, so this is a really, really aesthetic specimen. Um, I'll, I'll have to post it in the group in person, or a video of the actual specimen sometime. Um, but this piece has really gorgeous aesthetics, so I just had to paint it as soon as possible. Um, and you can see here uh, lots of very long striations in the stibnite. And I tried something kind of interesting. So as many, any of you might know, um, the uh, stibnites from China oftentimes have this slight iridescence or like a slight kind of bluish purplish coating. So I kind of wanted to emphasize that a little bit in this painting. Um, so there's a very, very subtle blue hue to uh, the stibnite crystals in this piece, as well as the calcite. The calcite also has these very subtle kind of warmish tones. So one important thing to consider when you're doing realism paintings, especially from minerals, is um, even if a, let's say, a rhodochrosite, let's say you have a red rhodochrosite. Sure, it's red, but when you really get down to it and you look at your reference photo and you really pay attention to that piece, it's not just red, you know, you have subtle variations in the color. Um, you can, uh, and especially in like natural lighting, you're going to see these like different uh, colors in here. So it's important not to just think about what your idea of the color of the specimen is, but like what you're actually seeing, if that makes any sense. Um, let's see here. Yeah, and then eight, eight by eight inches, so another relatively small, medium-sized painting. This was a fun one. I This was surprising to me. Um, I didn't, I thought this would be a, a bit troublesome, but I had a lot of fun. This is a Euclid uh, specimen from Columbia, as, and this piece in person is huge for the, look, for the, the spe uh, oh my goodness, uh, species and locality. It's, um... I can't remember exactly how big it is, but I, I'm pretty sure it's like a cabinet size specimen, which is crazy for this species. And this is next to a, a replica gemstone just to show the scale. And of course the specimen is really, really fantastic. But I think what I had the most fun with in this piece was actually painting the gemstone. This is the first time I had ever painted a gemstone. 
Uh, and I was really worried because it has all of these different uh, facets. Thank you, Kyle. 15 centimeters. That's massive. That's like, just think about that. It's a crazy piece. <laughs> um, but yeah, this gemstone has all of these facets and all these little details. And I was worried about it. But when you sketch out this gemstone, you map it out, it kind of becomes like a coloring book of sorts. You just take a look at all of these um, different sections and you just look at your reference picture, see what color is in the reference picture, color it in, and kind of out of nowhere it becomes what you're looking at. It just becomes a gemstone all of a sudden. So that's the interesting thing about painting is you work on all of these little sections that don't really look like much on their own. But when it finally comes together, you end up with this really fantastic representation of the object that you're uh, painting. Thank you, Melanie. <laughs> a witch or a wizard, I'm not sure which. Um, but again, really fantastic specimen. Very, very glad to have the opportunity to paint a piece like this. All right, so this is another piece in the collection of my friend Alan. This is an uh, L bite from the, oh goodness, Pedernia. I I'm going to leave that to you guys. <laughs> Um, but this was a really fun piece as well. Um, like I said earlier, tourmaline is very finicky because of the dimensionality. But as you can see in this close up, I kind of did my best to create these striations while also kind of giving a little bit of dimension to this crystal or these crystals. Um, and actually my favorite part is this, uh, smaller termination right here. Um, I, love painting terminations. I think that might be my favorite part about painting specimens, uh, specifically uh, specimen, or crystals that have this kind of prismatic shape. Um, I just think it's kind of interesting to see the color shifts inside that plateau. Um, but yeah, very interesting piece. The zoning was quite uh, finicky. It, it was a little difficult because it, it, you have to kind of create a smooth transition from this green color into a pink, which are obviously very, very uh, far apart on the color wheel. So it was a little difficult to kind of create that transition, but I pulled through, <laughs> thankfully. Um, so very, very happy with how that turned out as well. Let's see here. Next up, uh, this is still by on Apophyllite. So these uh, kinds of specimens where you have, you know, a large cabinet piece. I believe this specimen was about one and a half feet across. So this is a very, very large piece, which means there is a lot of detail packed into this because the crystals themselves weren't massive. So this piece took a lot of work, um, a lot of very, very careful sketching. So I think the most important part about painting is not the painting itself, but creating a solid foundation for the rest of your work. So it t it's very important to take the time to sketch out your piece, look at your reference pictures very carefully, set up a grid uh, to make it easier to compartmentalize and kind of focus on single areas at a time. And if you have an accurate sketch, your painting is going to be much better for it. So. I took a very long time to sketch this piece and try to outline all of the little apophyllite crystals that you see here, as well as the faces in the apophyllite crystals. As you can see, there's all these little triangles. Um, and it paid off. This, this, this piece definitely took a long time, but it 100% paid off. Um, and one thing I really like about this piece is uh, some of the translucency in the apophyllite crystals, especially this little corner right here. This might be my favorite spot. Um, and then that very nice contrast of the orange uh, uh, still bites on the apophyllite. I just think it's a kind of interesting piece. Um, again, very common material, not really the most exciting. But that's another thing about painting is even with uh, more common, uh, ordinary specimens, you get in there and you start painting all these details and you really, uh, get to appreciate, 
all of these little things about um, really any kind of speci uh, specimen or any uh, species of crystal or mineral. And this is in the uh, collection of actually uh, my, my friend's mother, uh, Mrs. Goss. That was a kind of interesting commission. Um, and that's hanging in her home right now. So hopefully I'll get to see that soon. Let's see. What did, what did you find hardest to paint? Good question. Um, ooh, a lot of things, but honestly, I'm going to have to say tourmaline. Tourmaline just really gets me every time. Um, it's interesting that you say that transparent minerals on matrix are hard to photograph for you. I can definitely see why, um, because of that depth that you need to capture. Um, I actually find transparent minerals, especially on matrix to be the easiest to paint. Or let me rephrase, not the easiest to paint, but the easiest to make uh, similar to your reference photo. Um, generally, o opaque specimens or matte specimens uh, tend to be more difficult to make realistic. I find that transparent, gemmy matrix, matrix pieces will turn out uh, the most realistic. So next, again, another aquamarine shore from the Irongo Mountains. Uh, Everyone knows that's that's kind of one of my favorite things in the mineral world. So this was a very early piece. I forgot to mention earlier, I actually only started painting minerals uh, in December of last year. So that very first slide that you saw, the other aquamarine and shoral, that was painted end of December. So I've been painting specimens for almost a year now. So this was another early piece. This was uh, painted, I believe, January of this year. Um, let me think. This piece was probably the most detailed that I had done at that point. And even now, I think it's still one of the most complex uh, paintings that I've done. Um, but again, even though it was complicated, I had so much fun with this, especially uh, painting all of the different faces of these beautiful shoral crystals and painting all of these small little scratches and uh, chips here in the crystals. Of course, you know, that's damage. That's not ideal. Um, but I, I just find it very fascinating when it's in a painting. I think it just adds a little extra spice, of course. Hi, Philip. Again, again another uh, fellow Arango lover. Good to see you here. Um, and then, of course, the albite uh, was tricky because it, a white matte mineral is a little difficult to convey with like these very subtle uh, shifts in tone. Um, but I think I did pretty okay there. Um, and then here, kind of an example of, of what I was saying earlier, um, these gemmy specimens, especially on a black background, are pretty easy to make realistic. As you can see, the background kind of shows through in this crystal in this window right here. And even a little bit here on this termination. Um, definitely the most fun for me to paint are those transparent minerals. So lots of detail, but very, very fun. And it just kind of comes together towards the end. And this is uh, another, probably one of my larger paintings, 9 by 12 inches. I'm hoping in the future to start getting into even larger canvases or papers, which is a little difficult considering how watercolor works. Because uh, you have to work pretty quickly before the water dries with each layer. Um, but I think I could come up with some pretty interesting results if I start painting on uh, larger canvases or papers. Um, not quite a year. Yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> or I guess it hasn't been a while. All right. So again, another Walensky piece. Um, this time an aquamarine and twirl from Pakistan. So this was another painting done on a, a rather small canvas, uh, just five by five by seven inches. Um, and even though it's a complicated piece, I didn't think it was too difficult to pack in all this detail in such a small piece of paper, just because the contrast really lends to like this, this visual impact that's easy to see even on a small piece of paper. Um, and of course, aquamarine, so lustrous, so gemmy. Um, so I had a lot of fun playing with these like very contrasting values here. 
uh, and the color of the specimen, very, very, very bright. Um, and it's always fun to paint with the bright, bright colors. Uh, fun little fact, this, this pigment that I used um, is phthalo blue, which you guys might be familiar with now because of the whole uh, heaven morphite situation that happened recently. Um, so when those studies came out, I thought it was very interesting because uh, I was already familiar with this pigment um, because it's used very often in uh, paintings, in, in paint. Um, so I don't know, maybe you could just call this hemomorphites painted specimens. You, maybe you could kind of spin that around into a work of art. <laughs> Ashley, okay, so I have painted with oils before. Um, in fact, uh, I don't post about this very often, so many of you may not know this, um, but I mostly paint in oil paints. So I normally do portraiture and sometimes still lifes, um, but of course portraiture is much more fun for me. So watercolor was a very recent uh, endeavor for me. So when I started painting uh, minerals, that's when I started using watercolor. So I've only been using watercolor since uh, December last year. Uh, yes, Brian, I am behind the Hemimore fights. That was me. <laughs> okay, this is a really cool piece just because I have a, a, a kind of a personal interest in it. Um, so this is a quartz specimen in the collection of Eric Rose. Eric Rose is a fantastic dealer in uh, specifically Japanese minerals. Uh, and as you could probably guess, uh, because of my name, I am Japanese. Um, and of course, Japanese minerals are not very easy to come by. So I get quite excited whenever I get to see Japanese minerals. Um, I actually have a couple uh, JLTs from Japan that I have in my collection. Um, but this piece is very interesting because the inclusions and the colors and like the gradients, it all, it's, it's very strange. I've never seen anything like this on quartz. It almost looks like a leopard or a cheetah was infused with a quartz specimen. Um, and I just thought that was a very interesting uh, texture. So I, I was very excited to paint this one. Um, let's see here. And I think my favorite part about this, besides those inclusions, as you can see in this close-up, are these little pits in the face of the crystals. I'm not sure what caused that, but those were very, very fun to paint for me. Um, as you can see here, the, the trick to getting these cracks to look like they have a little bit of depth is to add little highlights here outside of these cracks, which is going to make the inside of the, of the cracks feel like they're sunken in more. And then when you add these shadows, as you can see here, into these cracks, that's really going to give it that 3D effect. So um, when creating realistic mineral paintings. All of these small details will be uh, very, very important to the overall impact of your painting. Cougar quartz, that's fantastic. Uh, you're you're going to have to tell Eric um, that idea. He might want to take that and run with it. <laughs> and then just one other thing I really love about this piece is these orange gradients that kind of fade off very softly into this pale color in the middle. Um, I just thought that it was just a beautiful, beautiful effect. Almost like um, when you see those Japanese prints with those very soft, smooth gradients. It kind of reminds me of that. Thank you, Philip. I, I worked pretty hard on this presentation, so I'm very, very glad that you guys like it. Um, I, I try to kind of create this overall brand. One other thing you guys might not know is I, I'm actually a graphic designer by trade. Uh, I'm currently uh, in school for graphic design. So a little bit of everything. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Okay, so this piece is probably my new favorite specimen in my collection. So I acquired this emerald in calcite uh, from uh, Nick here in, in this group. And this piece is incredible to look at in person. And to be completely honest with you guys, I feel like I still haven't done it justice uh, through this painting medium. Of course, I, I'm very happy with this painting, but I think I'm going to try it again just, just to see how much I can push uh, my skills in, in order to kind of 
uh, portray the specimen as well as I can. Hi, Philip. Good to see you. Um, thank you to all my Europeans out here. I'm sure it's very late where you guys are. So it really means a lot to me that you guys are coming out here and uh, watching my presentation. Thank you for that. Um, but yeah, this, this is a, another good example of what I was saying earlier about very subtle variations in color. So of course, emerald, it's green. That emerald's green. But if you look closely at your specimens and if you look closely at photos, you'll see that there are some areas that are a little more blue and some areas that are a little more green. So I personally think it's very important to portray those very subtle color differences in your painting um, in, in order to create a more overall realistic representation. Um, and honestly, the most difficult part about this piece was the calcite. The calcite on this specimen is very amorphous. It all kind of comes together. Um, and it's a little difficult to kind of understand uh, the calcite um, unless you're seeing the piece in person. So that's something that I really want to work on if, if I uh, repaint this piece. So uh, Emerald and Calcite from the famous Musa Mine. Awesome, awesome specimen. This is my favorite specimen in my collection, maybe even my favorite specimen ever. Um, just a really fun piece. So this is another early painting. This is uh, Nept uh, Neptunite and Benidoite. And you might be wondering, where is the Benidoite? I don't see Benidoite. There is a tiny, teeny little Benidoite crystal hiding behind that Neptunite. Um, pretty cute little thing. Uh, it's kind of fun to look at that crystal with a uh, loop in person. Um, but I did buy the specimen for the Neptunite. I might be one of those people that just prefers Neptunite over Benidoi, <laughs> but I just love the contrast of Neptunite against that, uh, Naturalite, uh, uh, matrix. I, I suppose you could call it a matrix or the coating on the matrix. And this piece is so lustrous and it has this very nice aesthetic balance to it because you have this kind of almost triangular shape to the piece and then you have these two neptunite crystals kind of pointing directions outwards uh from the the center of that kind of triangle so very very aesthetic specimen um this might be a piece that i might not repaint but continue to work on uh so this is an earlier piece so Obviously, I wasn't as practiced with painting these like very matte, very subtle minerals like this Naturalite. So I might go back and add even more texture to this white and just kind of give it that boost that it needs. Um, and then one other thing you can I don't know if you can tell, but there are these little red flecks. So net tonight uh, when it cleaves and if you catch in the right light, it has these red tones. So I uh, tried to implement that red color here in the painting. I believe this is the last painting that I have to present to you guys today. Uh, funny thing, I painted this last night. <laughs> I, um, this is a, my most recent painting that I've done. Um, Troy, if, if you're watching this, this might be a surprise to you, but uh, another Walensky piece. Um, this is really incredible. This is a morganite crystal associated with this gorgeous blue cap tourmaline. And in fact, before I saw the specimen, I didn't know that morganite, uh, was associated with tourmaline in California. That was kind of crazy, um, to learn about, but, um, I adore morganite and seeing it with this beautiful tourmaline was really, really fun. Um, let's see here. I thought I saw a question, but unfortunately, um, I can't scroll through the comments. Okay, do I always work from a reference? Yes, I do. I think it's very important to use a reference. In fact, if you want several references to um, really make sure that that specimen looks as realistic as possible. Um, I Once I, I did paint from a specimen in real life. Oh yeah, so uh, Putsu, um, this this I did use a uh, photo for. Unfortunately, I, I don't get to um, 
travel to the Wilansky Gallery anytime soon because of the COVID situation. But um, the the photographer for Wilansky, his name is uh, Evan um, Giarpino. He is an amazing photographer. And what I found is that really, really good photos um, will make your painting so much better because that is your reference. The better your reference, the better the final product, product is going to be. So um, really, really glad to have a great photographer taking pictures of these pieces for me to paint. Um, but yeah, really fantastic piece. As I was saying a while back, um, you have this dimension... The, the, these multiple dimensions in the tourmaline. You have these internal fractures and then you have those outer striations, um, which are very, very difficult to convey. But I did my best here. Um, so I'm pretty happy with this piece. Let's see. And I think that is all I have today. Thank you guys so, so much. Uh, this was my very first presentation ever. <laughs> so I, I'm very glad that it went well.